Valerie, good to have you here for What Matters in Archaeology for Sarasota and Manatee. Displays, puzzles, and videos for a Florida Archaeology Month exhibit. Uh, my interest has revolved around the politics of the past, issues of representation, uh, but it's always had an empirical basis. And last January, engaging some excavations at Philippia State Park with some wonderful students, including Chris, uh, we engaged in some archaeology. And thanks to Sarasota and Harold Tribb for getting uh, the story and the, uh, reporting on the story for things in the county, we got a lot of media attention. In fact, an overwhelming amount of media attention, eight stories and videos for a project that just lasted for two days and really did not have a particularly sophisticated research design, but really showed clearly the level of interest in Sarasota for archeology. span And that kind of pointed me after January. One of my goals as director of the New Garden Public Archaeology Lab is not to fixate on archeology span in terms of excavations. The flow chart you see there uh, situates the work. Right? There's always uh, research design, always research questions. Excavations is what uh, people usually associate with archaeology, but I've always stressed having a lab for analysis of the finds and other materials, the work in cleaning and amplification and conserving, the cataloging, the scholarship that comes out of the work, but also way there on top, the exhibit of the material. And that's what I wanted to focus on this spring. Every year, there's a Florida Archaeology Month that's coordinated by the Florida Anthropological Society and supported by the Department of State, specifically the Division of Historical Resources. And the goal, as it says on the slide, is to encourage Floridians and visitors to learn more about the archaeology and history of the states and to preserve these important parts of Florida's rich cultural heritage. But that's just slogans, right? The, the question is, how do we make that meaningful for people? for the people of Sarasota. Well, this particular year, 2016, uh, proved to be a little problematic. The previous two years, the focus of attention in Florida Archaeology Month was first the Paleo Indian period, and Sarasota County has low salt spring, warm mineral spring, so I focused the attention on those Paleo Indian sites. Last year was the archaic and historic Spanish point as one of the most important late archaic sites, frankly, in the, the country. So that was easy. But this year, they focused on the woodland period. And we see the dates up there. Well, the site we were excavating at Philippia State Park was a similar period, but it's the Minnesota in this region. And unlike what we find in northern Florida, with wonderful designs and statues and the rest, the Minnesota period in Sarasota Manti is really boring. The pottery is plain. The tools are shell. How do we get that? To work? Well, the first task, and the most important task, is always preserving the past, recognizing that, in fact, that past is important. I have just two images up here from two very different time periods. One, what was, what is State Mound Street, part of the Tamiami Trail, that shows the mound that had been there and that provides a name for the place. And just north of us here on campus, the remains in the late 1990s of a drive in theater, which is long since gone. Florida Archaeology Month is meant to highlight the Florida past and also get us to think about why we should be preserving it. So my approach, knowing I needed creativity, was to put out a call for students to come and join a tutorial. And here you see the nice lineup with Valerie Jackson Bell helping to co-teach this tutorial. And thanks to this, uh, the Cook Library being able to use the lobby space for the exhibit. And this presentation today is very much about what we tried to do for pioneers, runaways, and snowbirds in archaeology of Sarasota Manatee. You see the names of the students who took part in the tutorial and the exhibits. We focused on these three words to give a sense of the peoples who came through, because my stress for archaeology is always the history in terms of what people did, how they did it, and why they did it. And what we end up having, having in the exhibit is a lot of materials strewn out through two parts of the lobby, but also a lot of good creative work. And that's what the rest of today's presentation is going to focus on, the creative work that came out of these three students. 
So we'll start with Alex. So hello, my name is Alex Catellis, uh, and I focused on creating a timeline. So if you guys, I we made the timeline out of archaeological flagging tape, so that way it was eye-catching. And originally we had multiple colors as well. Uh, so for this, we wanted to show the length of periods in Florida history. So the timeline was a total of 36 feet. And so this is about seven feet now. And this is for the Paleo-Indian era. It was the earliest era in Florida's history. And it's notable for having large megafauna. And also I just put the size, a little key, so the sizes of people uh, standing next to the megafauna. So we had some very large sloths in Florida. And mammoths that were surprisingly not as large as the movie Ice Age would make you think in Florida. So next one, which is the same. Same. It's the same. Yeah. Oh, what? Yeah, the early archaic periods of around the same length as well. So this era, um, the coastline began shrinking in, and this is, um, and I included some of the arrowheads as well just to show some of the difference that their hunting techniques were changing, and also maybe what they were hunting was also changing. They didn't need as large arrowheads because the mammals weren't as large. They're getting smaller, they're going extinct. Next one. Middle was over there. Uh, the Middle Archaic period. Uh, this is, I, well, Little Salt Springs like between middle and late, so I included it on the middle slide. And this is where uh, Professor Baram did his excavation in Northport. And, it was, and the arrowheads are definitely quite different to that era. It's definitely changing. The coastline is shrinking in, and they found a very nice bone fragment as well at that site. So, and the, it's a slightly smaller period, but then we go back to a longer era, the late archaic period, which notably in Sarasota County, there's the um, historic Spanish points in Osby, which is a great place. And they have this wonderful exhibit here where you can look into the side of a archeological mound the arrowheads are getting pointier, more defined, and there, there's definitely pottery now. There's pottery shards. And now after the late archaic area, the periods begin getting smaller. Uh, the Manasota period, which is which happened around the same time as the Woodland period, happens around Sarasota Manatee County, hence the name. Uh, these are just the top right is a mound in. Um, Emerson Point Preserve, uh, and there's just some of the other mounds and some um, drawing illustrations of what archaeologists thought um, the pioneers in Florida were doing, how they collected shells, how they fish, etc. Uh, next is the Whedon Island and Safety Harbor cultures. It happened more or less around the same time. As you see, the eras are getting shorter and shorter. So. Um, this is just, they had nice pottery. They had like a nice big piece of pottery there. It's, it wasn't as nice as the woodland period pottery, like Professor Brown was saying. And they had more um, sophisticated tools, such as an atlatl and also hatchets as well. And now we get to the European era, and you'll see the, now the thing I would like pointing out in my timeline was that the, after the Europeans arrived, the measurements of time increments began getting smaller and smaller. So during the first Spanish period, when you had the top one is Hernando de Soto, and the bottom one is uh, Pedro Menendez de Aviles, who was the founder of St. Augustine. When the Europeans were here, they broke the time up to much smaller ways. So, And it's just, I wanted to make it clear that the history of Florida was there was just so much going on here before Europeans got here. So, and next we have is the British period. So, and one of the things I love about, I love, it's a very, very small, yeah, about 20 years. Uh, one of my, in between two treaty of Par treaties of Paris, no, no less. Um, one of my favorite things about this though is I love old maps. And this is a new and accurate map of East and West Florida. New and accurate, so uh, I just like.
pointing out will be some people think is accurate, some days changes as time goes on. So and there's our pal from George III and then the British flag during this era. So continue. Second Spanish period, the Spanish um, retook Florida after the end of the American Revolution. And there was not the Europe, there was very little European activity in Sarasota Manatee County. But at, during this time, we did have Spanish fishermen, the ranchos, um, having little um, cabins along the ports, not along along the coasts uh, to, for fishing. So this is also the time of the uh, large exodus of slaves, hence the name runaways, to the area, such as the Angola settlement on the Manatee River, as well as um, in other parts of Florida, such as the Fort at Prospect Rock in North Florida. So then with the, the well, adams Onis Treaty, I believe, in 1821, Florida became part of the U.S., and slavery was brought down. Well, first I should say Andrew Jackson came down and led a series of massacres known as the Seminole Wars and pretty much cleansed Florida of a lot of its Native American history. The Seminoles as well as the Miccosukee and several other tr tribes. But the, the Florida seceded as, as well as joined the Confederacy during the Civil War and there was slavery. This is actually a wanted slave, a runaway slave ad from Tampa in 1860. Um, that, and then we have the final era, the, the growth of modern Florida, the 1880s to the present, and it's just the remarkable amount of growth that happened starting around the 1880s when there was so little development or settlement here to the burgeoning larger area that there is here today. And so, yeah, so it's just how much the area has changed. And so that's the end of my part.
getting a little bit more in detail. And another component was scrapbooking the wildlife. So ethnobotany, so this kind, this was another student's contribution and I'm tying it in because it's still relevant because the food that you get, the plants that you find around were obviously used. You could make medicine from them, you could make foods from them. The Yupon holly that's right here and the Sushi plant were both made and used in stews, used in bread. So you get that incorporation and then see how it's used throughout the time. We have some pressed, we have the pressed um, leaves and we also have nice details and pictures. And you can find most of these plants just around the campus. And then we move a little bit more into what Rachel did. And here's also the uh, fisherman's quilt, I believe it's called, uh, depicting sort of the rancho period. All right. So for our first day of class, it was over there yep. in the library in one of the study rooms, and we talked about what we liked and what we didn't like about museums we've been to. So we had this range of from the, uh, from the mall in DC to Ringling to the Dali Museum to random car museums in Georgia, talking about what we liked about them, what we didn't like about them. And what a lot of people said was like, I liked that there was information, but it wasn't very accessible to me. Like, so we need much more interaction. That was the first thing we were thinking going into this project, is interactive aspects of our um, exhibit. So here you can see, uh, this is someone else's project. They, um, Classify these shells, there are numbers, you can match them with what kind of shell you think it is, and it also has the um, function used through history. So Chris will pass those around. Pass those around. <laughs> you can feel free to play the game after it's passed around. <laughs> well, Not you're the full version of shells. <laughs> 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 but still. And um, so that was one of the, we tried to, as Pacific, uh, sorry, Professor Baron, coins gamify part of the exhibit. So this was Sarah's contribution of matching the shells with their function. And I was taking on more contemporary history with the Ringling family. And while I could not necessarily fit every single contributing Ringling in the family tree on one poster board, I, um, I did the immediate family of the Ringling brothers with a final sister and um, who, who of the descendants most contributed to the Ringling Estate and well, most influenced the Ringling Estate. So I made a logic puzzle. And um, also, so we can figure out who existed in the family and how their um, material culture still exists presently. So I also have uh, get, um, uh, I also have pictures of um, open source pictures of the mansions and who they belong to that you can figure out. So of course it starts with the parents and then we see the brothers with their sister and who married whom and produced whom and you can figure it out with these instructions, these clues I provided. So for example, Augustus was born after Albie before Otto, those logic puzzles you used to do in elementary school like that, but with the Ringling family. And I just thought this really like interactive aspect I could produce because it's confusing. There are so many brothers. There are so many and they all look very similar. And <laughs> I love so, that. Yeah, right? <laughs> so, yeah. So I was able to put a name to the faces that we're very familiar with while also attaching them to their material culture, which we're still living with presently, like College Hall, like the Kazan, like the um, Hester Ringling, Lancaster, Stanford. Mansion, what's it called? The box that we have. Oh, nice. Yeah, so you can see them in there. I'm sure our president can tell us uh, that Charles Edith Ringling Mansion fairly. <laughs> that one I know. That one I know. <laughs> so, yeah, that was um, my goal with this was to be able to attach identities to faces and identities to the material culture we we're still working with at New College. Um, another part of the exhibit was. There, was, there were two students who created uh, videos where they went to sites near in, in Sarasota Manatee and interviewed people.
who worked there or who oversaw <coughs> them, and we also had a video game commission a couple years ago. Two video games. Two video games, whoa. About, <laughs> about rancho life in um, Sarasota and what it was like, and they're a little bit challenging. It was surprisingly <laughs> challenging. <laughs> the racing game is very difficult. I played it with a friend, and uh, one of the boats glitched when it got to Tampa, and so the other boat won by default, even though it never got close to Tampa Bay. So, everything has their own, like, real-life challenges. <laughs> <laughs> so, even interactive using the grids. <laughs> so, those were on display for the whole month. The computer was there alongside the interactive section we had near the bathrooms, near the um, co-lab. And we also had two students who did interviews and a video. We'll show you a short portion here, which works, I promise. Uh, <laughs> Wheaton Island has a large history of inhabitation, beginning in the Middle Archaic period around 7,000 years ago and stretching to the Wheaton Island culture, which ended around 1,000 years ago. Evidence of the earliest cultures comes from the presence of lithics, including projectiles, scrapers, knives, drills, and hammer stones. This culture was in the transition from a hunter-gatherer phase to a sedentary phase, and possessed no pottery. The culture that formed after this, the Manasota culture, had a variety of tools, was sedentary, meaning that they lived in one place, and began to use pottery. Following the Manasota period, Wheaton Island culture emerged, lasting until a thousand years ago. Wheaton Island culture is separated into two distinct periods, characterized by their respective pottery styles. All of these various cultures would have subsisted on local flora and fauna, including large quantities of seafood. These peoples left large shell mounds that we can find today, indicating that they consumed a large amount and variety of shellfish. Beyond their large seafood diet, Florida Native Americans would have eaten deer and indigenous Floridian plants, such as kunti and various wild fruits and berries. Don't do it. But, uh, <laughs> uh, our, for the, the about this is that we were able to have it on a loop for the entire month available in the library. So you had the option to go up on headphones and watch it however many minutes you want. Six minutes long? It's a six minutes. Yeah, so you can watch the whole thing. You can leave when you're as soon as you're done figuring out the information. And I thought that was something similar to the things you see in museums often where they have their own separate rooms. It's actually one of these in the main wing. Yep. Where you can like, it's open doors. You can walk in and walk out however you want. But like the space itself is more obligatory than this was. And while we have several other inf informative sections, the the option to go there with the headphones, I feel like, was um, more more casual. And we still had the visuals going on the entire time, and it still had subtitles, so you can still watch it. Um, Could I add one thing yeah, also? Uh, the narrator of this was also the, one of the students in the museology tutorial, Michael has such a great yes. narrator voice. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Michael has a very good and narrator made, voice. We don't have yeah. a clip where Haley is pointing to things, but those mm -hmm. were two great. Definitely look, look at the YouTube video channel to check yeah. out this YouTube feed. Yeah, if you want the address, we can give it to you after the talk. It is, that is the channel. I yes. <laughs> and another student, um, Kara. Kara, she, she, she went to, she went, um, she, looked up places around the Sarasota Manatee area where you could visit and included the information, um, like phone numbers, addresses, to where you can call, see if you can like schedule a visit there, schedule a tour there, or just go there for an afternoon. Um, which I think is also a way that you don't have to oblige a person to do something, but it's also another interactive thing where you say, oh, this looks interesting and it's near where I live, the map's included. So you can definitely see where things are. If it's near you, you can say, wow, this weekend, I feel like going to <laughs> <Valley> <laughs> and see it has, it has the, the address here and the phone number here, so you can schedule anything, and it's totally up to the, um, the viewer, the visitor, to, to see if they would want to go there. And all these places look interesting, and I wish I had time.
but the resource is very useful to people who are interested in uh, local archaeology, local history. And in terms of praxis, <laughs> we have um, our, our, our day where we each assign ourselves a time slot to be able to give people tours around the spaces in the library. We had places available, we had um, interactive things and information available. Um, we also had this exercise outside just to like, get attention from people. We also had like people like, to like spin your hats, those metal armor hats, yeah. And um, what we have here is a throwing stick and a wooden rabbit, if you can see down here. <laughs> we have a student throwing it. <laughs> Most people were unsuccessful, but there was one who was just got it immediately. <laughs> <laughs> No actual rapids were hurt in this exercise. Once you got the hang of it, you did hit it pretty consistently as I could do. There was one person from the tour group who came up, nailed the rabbit, and left. <laughs> Probably going to a school with athletics, but we uh, proved that new college students might need a little assistance if we have to go back to the hunting aspect. <laughs> So yeah, we were able to gather attention. We had people like, oh, hey, do you want to come try to see if you survive in a hunting gathering environment? Yeah, sure. So we had people practice this, and we also would be able to leave them inside to see more information around the library. As well as promote, this was on the same day as the talk in Saner, so it was for people who maybe were coming to the talk and said, let's check out what they're actually doing in there, or I need to kill some time, or in terms of students, I don't want to write my paper, please help. One of the reasons why we focused a lot on food in the exhibit was because in March, the day we did these tours of the exhibit was Michael Twitty, who is a food anthropologist. Sorry. Food historian. Food historian. Food historian, okay. And he is, he's a food historian who studies um, African American cuisine and he cooks it and he does a lot of heritage studies of like African cuisine, African American cuisine. So he was here and that's why we wanted to focus a lot on food for the exhibit too. I'm not sure if you ever got around to seeing it, but. <laughs> he our, was our, very our busy. Food. Yeah, we also had a theme of food, yeah, going through, just, just going to the month generally, we had that theme. And then we of course had to take it down. <laughs> that was a fun day. <laughs> and store it in the archeology span lab. Um, and Japi is easier than putting it up. So yes. <laughs> now we come to the question of is what, what kind of things do we think we should want to continue next year for Toy Arch Archaeology Month? What kind of things do you think we can improve on? Or maybe we can get more time somehow yeah. to develop exhibits further? And that's where we open it up. To everybody. <laughs> Suggestions or things you like, things you thought we could improve on. If you went to the exhibit, share your experience. If you worked on the exhibit, you can share your experience. <laughs> Directing that at this side of the room. <laughs> but yeah, that, that, this is what we did for Florida Archaeology Month. I hope you enjoyed Thank seeing you our products. Thank you for coming. And of course, if you have any feedback, we'd love to hear it. More questions. Yeah. <laughs> That's what you say. Yeah. Could actually, some of the food, um, it, is it possible to prepare it and oh. eat it? Well, no, you know, one of the things, uh, Florida Archaeology Month has been ongoing for like eight, nine years. And it, it's, a, it's a national movement to just kind of use anniversaries to get people interested. I mean, I think it, it fits really nice, the idea of having a, a one a period of during the year that we focus. And so the state did this for March. I'm not sure why March, but the, we followed on it. And two years ago, I decided just to put a little exhibit together, thanks to Kelly Reed and the good folks at the library. And we got the library books out, and uh, my friends at the Florida Public Archaeology Network had some materials. We put them out as posters that come out every year. Then the following year, I expanded that a little bit and made some panels. And there was just a little bit of interest in it. Uh, this year, because of the, as I started with, because of the excavations, got so much attention in January, I decided to just send out an email to the student body, you know, just randomly, 
and 10 students, including these three, showed up. And the idea was, let's see what creativity they had. Valerie Jackson Bell was there to provide some uh, uh, validity, <laughs> since my tendency is to be abstract. <laughs> <laughs> and to just say, well, let's see what happens. Valerie, with her the tremendous experience of museum work, was like, oh, we have to be practical. <laughs> and so we had a little bit of, of a balance there. But I think what you saw with this uh, material, Alex and his uh, tapes, <laughs> and uh, Rachel with their gamification of everything, anything and everything, and Chris with just the idea of making these things. Right? Yeah. I, I, I had a very light hand, with, and which is my tendency to say, let's see what you come up with. I think Valerie was a little uh, disturbed by that notion, let's see what happens. And in fact, the disasters were really useful. <laughs> when the library lost a plane of glass, uh, the Alex had made this wonderful timeline uh -huh. using the stadium rods, but they needed that for the hazard tape. So it got this oh. good How work. Part of the timeline was used for that, though. <laughs> and it had a higher purpose. But you know, when I think about this work, it's not just an exhibit for the sake of an exhibit. It's very much a learning process. What do you do when things go wrong? I think that's a good lasting lesson because that, well, I know my personal experience, that always seems to happen. <laughs> and really wasn't my question. Oh, yeah. yeah. Who looks? Uh, <laughs> Sorry. I, was wondering, I was wondering if we could actually get something that was edible. Oh, you know, like that black tea or that very, I mean, maybe well, that. I, I think Steve, Steve, Steve will need to talk to Brian about yeah. bringing food into the <laughs> library. <laughs> 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 and that we'll be able to build even more based on this, plus the wonderful enthusiasm that you just heard, whether they want to take part or not, I think they can convey that enthusiasm to another group of students, and you know, push it even further in terms of interactive activities. Yeah, and maybe we can sort of commercialize the game a bit. No, so it's the Rainway Museum. We have to work on intellectual property right issues first. <laughs> So thank you to the students, thank you to Valerie, thank you so 